You're listening to the Intrepid Radio Program with Scotty Roberts. Intelligent Talk. Happy Monday evening, folks. Sure glad that you stopped by to listen to this program, the Intrepid Radio Program, with me, your host, Scotty Roberts, right here on the Odyssey Radio Network. That's O-D-Y-S-Y-1 dot com. Come on over and see all the goodness that is Odyssey Radio. At the same time, come on over and join the live chat room with the other Intrepids over on my YouTube channel, and you can watch the uh, video simulcast of this broadcast. On my YouTube channel, that's youtube.com slash Mr. Scotty Roberts. Now, I hope you all had a fantastic weekend, maybe one as fantastic as mine was. And it was uh, pretty low-key. I mean, it was a, a gorgeous, absolute gorgeous sunshine. I spent most of the weekend in the sun, uh, out either gardening with my wife or... Uh, uh, we had the kids out to a scouting event where they were climbing on all these towers and zip lines and stuff like that. Even my five-year-old little girl got up there all by herself. She's 30 feet off the ground. And she's, you know, they all use all these locked harnesses and things like that to get around from thing to thing. And she's switching around and clipping things on. And she needed a little help up there and she didn't want to come down. And mom and I were down on the ground. Mom was worrying, oh, I should go get her. and But there were, you know, staff up there helping her. So it was a fantastic time with the kids. Uh, they had a great time doing all the zip line stuff. And um, then on Sunday, uh, Rainy and I actually got a day without kids. Uh, we uh, hired the girl next door, who uh, the 16-year-old, to be the sitter uh, for the kids. And they all went outside and played and stuff like that, and she took them bowling and, uh, uh, for pizza and bowling. And mom and dad, Rainy and I, went over to Rocky Stucci and Lisa Stucci's house yesterday, and we sat in the sun on the patio all afternoon, uh, eating steak and burgers and uh, smoking cigars. And uh, so it was a fantastic day. I think uh, we added it all up. We were gone like seven hours. So, it doesn't sound like a grand long time, but it'd be like taking a whole work day, most of a work day, and spending it screwing around. And so that's all we did. Now, we also did a little broadcast yesterday, a live stream on Facebook from Rocky's studio uh, with Rocky and me and our wives. And if you want to see that, it got a little weird and funny because not only were we smoking cigars and eating steak, uh, we also had a little bit of tequila. And so uh, um, that broadcast, I haven't even watched it back yet. It's probably very interesting. But you can go find that on Rocky's Facebook page. You can find his uh, video stream from yesterday. I don't know if it's worth watching or if it's scary to watch. Uh, but it was fun and funny as we were doing it. So that was my weekend. I hope your weekend was just as nice. It's supposed to get really hot here uh, this week, so I hope your weather isn't too oppressive. In uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, up here, it either goes from frigid tundra, frozen wasteland in the winter, to subtropical, you know, the upper 90s, sometimes into the low 100s and high dew points and humidities, and uh, it can get pretty bad And uh, in the summertime. Oppressive is what I'm saying. But uh, so we enjoy those beautiful in-betweens like yesterday in the weekend, uh, and and I hear my cat uh, during the broadcast. My cat is over at the door wanting to get out. Hang on. I got to let him out of here. I didn't know he was in here. Hold on a second. And uh, I can talk you through this. So, yeah, yeah, Oscar, I see you. Bye. He likes to uh, hide from the world under my desk. And so there he was. Down below the desk, sleeping, and now he wants out. So, pardon that little uh, semi-familial uh, 
veterinary type of uh, intrusion into our radio show. I had to let him out or he'd be sitting here and meowing through the entire show. Caterwauling, scratching on the door. He doesn't have any front claws. He just pounds boom, 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 on the door. So um, had to get him out of here. So good weekend. Let's start the week out right. Uh, we wanted, we left off on Friday. We were talking for a couple of days about dreaming and about the mystical side of dreaming. We talked about the subconscious side, the chemical reaction side, if you will, the part of the brain that has us replay events or create new events in our minds uh, that help process information that we take in through the days. And I said, there's also that mystical side, that side that is not explainable by science, other than to say it's another chemical reaction in the brain, but that side that says we've had contacts, we have um, uh, mystical I'm trying to think of a better way to word this, uh, that, that mystical side that says maybe there are messages in our dreams being delivered from elsewhere. Now you're going to have your skeptics right away that will, uh, and maybe even scientists that will stand up and say, well, that's all just part of the chemical reaction of the mind. It's things you think about. It's in your subconscious and so on. What if it's not? What if there are things from the outside that come in? And uh, this is kind of where we left off. We were mentioning uh, this Jungian side that uh, Carl Jung pioneered uh, in his work uh, the key to our modern understanding of archetypes, and that these archetypes or archetypes, however you want to say it, uh, appear in our dreams. It nevertheless, his even his work fell a little bit short in one crucial respect, at least as far as mystics are concerned. Jung believed that becoming conscious of archetypical influences helps human beings evolve toward the highest goal of life, which in his view was individuation. That's becoming the whole and the self-actualized individual. It was all a psychological process. And this process of psychic integration is driven by what Jung thought of as the greater self, the total psyche including its unconscious dimensions. And in the mystic's view, however, the highest goal in life is not any sort of individuation process. On the contrary, it's an attainment of a realization, of a gnosis, of an enlightenment of knowledge, of knowing things, uh, the enlightenment of one's own identity with that ground of all being, which is called variously god Brahman, Buddha, nature, or the da or the Tao, as we would say, the conscious its consciousness itself that that is what's being developed, and that's the difference between psychological points of view, even Jungian points of view, and a mystical point of view. And in fact, for mystics, the struggle to attain this goal constitutes the ultimate archetypical drama, which is reenacted by every seeker who walks a spiritual path. Look at yourself and ask what it is. Is spiritual spirituality to you, is it something that's kind of hovering out there and, and it doesn't really meet the rubber of the road in our daily lives, or is it something that guides your daily life? Even when I was in Christian ministry, I used to say, when I was a youth pastor to the kids, you know, I would, and I've told you this before, I would ask them, uh, um, what is it you truly believe? Why do you believe what you believe? Remember the own, our radio series several months back, all when we got into mysticism and Gnosticism and all this other stuff about Christian history started with the question, why do you believe what you say you believe? So is what you believe your spirituality, is it something that is part of you? Something that you need to grow? Or is it that occasional thing that we kind of go, oh yeah, we kind of acknowledge that it's there, but we don't really practice that on a daily level. And I'm not talking about dressing in weird robes and sitting on the mountain and becoming an aesthetic or anything like that. I'm talking about just how we consciously deal with our spirituality. And so the mystic says that the struggle to attain the goal of being that person who is enlightened, realization, gnosis, awake, if you will, 
is not woke, but awake. Uh, this is reenacted by every seeker who walks the spiritual path, especially when they dream. Thus, understanding the drama, that drama in particular, is essential not only for understanding the spiritual path as a whole, but also for the spiritual interpretation of your dreams, which consists precisely in seeing how the archetypical elements that appear in dreams fit into and further the action of this archetypical story. Uh, what follows then is an overview of this story. And this is what we're going to dig into a little bit now. Uh, you have to call this kind of the, the journey to enlightenment. Uh, it's drawn from versions found in all great traditions out there. And because from a mystical perspective, psychology and cosmology are ultimately indistinguishable. Psychology and cosmology are indistinguishable. And this journey actually involves a double movement, which has its beginning in the eternal now, before creation, here in the limitless ocean of pure, formless consciousness. Everything is blissfully one. And in order to realize its potential for manifesting infinite forms, however, consciousness starts to imagine or dream a world of forms in which it appears as a perceiving of self. And so at first, <clears throat> as it witnesses the dance of its own creation, the self, who you really are, experiences nothing but delight. And at some point, however, the self brings uh, to hallucinate, begins to hallucinate that this cosmos of swirling forms has a reality that's separate from itself. Now, instead of oneness, the self experiences loneliness. Instead of bliss, fear. Instead of delight, suffering. So having fallen into this delusion and forgotten what it's like to, to have true identity, that that true identity is consciousness itself, the self starts to weave a story within the story. And it's a dream within a dream in which it sees itself as an isolated ego moving farther and farther out into the world of forms searching for its lost happiness. Now, you might not be consciously aware that this is happening in your dreams especially, but you are experiencing it. And if you stand back for a second and think about it and look at it, you'll realize this is what's happening. Because the world of forms is inherently ephemeral. Uh, sooner or later, the self starts to realize that its quest for worldly happiness is futile. And, I, and, 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 and so begins to lose interest. Have you been at that place where you see things that are happening in your life the way you experience them, the way you respond to them, the way it affects you, uh, you start to realize that worldly happiness and the quest for that is a futile goal. Uh, it just you don't get anywhere. Life is shitty. And uh, sometimes you experience it, moments of happiness and joy and fun and bliss, but you go back to the drudgery. Why do we always say Monday? Oh, it's Monday. I got to go back to work. Uh, type of thing, or I got to get back to business because the weekend's over. So we experience the two days of hopefully of getting away from that stuff, and then we enter into oh, it's Monday. I got to go back into the realization that my life is shitty, and I got to work for some guy, <coughs> and so that's a problem. Let me take a drink of coffee. Mm. I've got the dry throat going on today, the scratchy throat. I think it's my allergies. My eyes are going too. They're just fuzzy today. And I think it's just allergens in the air. It's that time of year. So now that its attention is somewhat freed from worldly pursuits, this attention to try to seek the happiness, the self begins to remember, however dimly, the ocean of consciousness from whence it came and to which it increasingly longs to return. And thus, having reached the limit of its outer journey, as it were, the self reverses course and begins the inner spiritual journey. 
that will eventually carry it back to its source. Only then can the dream break and the self awaken to its true identity as consciousness itself. This is what we all go through. Every one of us go through this whether we are aware of it happening or not. So why not just become aware that this is what this happens to us. This is what's going on. So now for the most of us, accomplishing the second part of this journey is by no means an easy thing at all. In order to realize our true identities, we have to shed all the layers of egoic and you see the word ego in there, egoic identity built up during our long sojourn in the land of delusion. When we talked about how the world is a dream around us, we talked about that several months ago, and you have to become aware and awake that you are part of that and you can be in the now. That's what we do. We pull out of that delusion. Unfortunately, however, we're not alone in the task. In fact, from the very beginning, consciousness with a capital C has been calling us to awaken from our dream-tuned nightmare. The trouble is, we've been too absorbed in the worldly pursuits and egoic dramas to hear it. This absorption persists, persists whether we're awake or sleeping, which is why worldly people's dreams are filled primarily with worldly contents. And by worldly, I just mean we're, we live and dwell in the world and we don't seek the higher plane. And once we embark on a spiritual path, however, everything begins to change. Now we call out to consciousness, usually in the form of some divine other, and you know what I mean uh, by that, the divine other, God, Brahma, uh, uh, whoever might be at their source. And the divine other responds by sending us various kinds of guidance. And in our waking states, this guidance manifests in the form of teachers, teachings, books we read, all of that stuff. Uh, and, and we start to encounter those. The more we look for it, the more we find it. It's like uh, I saw somebody put a post up on Facebook this morning. Somebody who I've usually seen as being fairly left of center and fairly harsh on us in the United States uh, saying uh, and all the goings on but saying that really if you look for evil you will find evil and uh, talking about the virus how the virus is out there but 99.95 percent of people survive it if they catch it uh that uh um racism is out there but 90 9.95% of us never experience it. Um, and and the, the point was being that we create... What do you think is going on in the world right now around you? We, we are what we create. We are what we manifest. Look what's being manifest out there. And so you have to detach from that and say, that's not what I'm going to be. And you look for a higher goal. And so these are the manifestations that happen in the forms of archetypical figures, motifs, symbols that begin to appear not only in our waking minds, but in our dreams. So when you seek to be awake, when you seek to be set apart, when you seek to be not part of the dream world around you, so to speak, all of a sudden you're going to start running into the things that you want to manifest. And it happens in your dreams. So sometimes, a dream with an exceptionally strong archetypical contact can actually par uh, precipitate a shift from worldly to spiritual life in you. Watch your dreams. Watch what the content is. In most cases, however, this happens more gradually. It's not like an overnight thing, like one night I have, you know, processing dreams and the next night all of a sudden I'm spiritual and I'm getting uh, contacts or I'm getting uh, consciousness dreams. It's generally a gradual process as you gradually graduate yourself from living a life that manifests the, the junk around it or living a life that rises above it, that separates from it, that lives in the now, that is awake and aware. 
And that's even after we begin a spiritual path, our dreams still tend to be dominated by egoic contents, with our typical elements appearing only sporadically and in somewhat diluted forms. And so this results in mixed dreams, which still require a good deal of interpretation if we're to fully decipher their meanings. But the more we progress on a path, the more archetypical content starts to emerge and the clearer our dreams become. Until finally, the ratio is inverted so that archetypical content now dominates while egoic content come to play only a secondary role. So your dreams, your consciousness, you get that? The consciousness kicks in and takes over as opposed to just your brain chemically processing the day's events. And so although dreams with predominantly archetypical content need far less interpretation uh, to comprehend them, we have to still learn the language of archetypes, which is the language of symbols. And this requires familiarizing ourselves with the world's great myths, the world's great epics, the great legends, the folk tales, as well as exposing ourselves to various comparative studies of them. And here we have only space to consider briefly only a few kinds of archetyp archetypes. Uh, how did I, I said that kind of backwards? Um, what kind of space do you dedicate in your own mind to learning about these things? And so we only briefly touch on them from day to day, if at all, maybe week to week, once a week once a month, once every six months. Uh, do you expose yourselves to the great myths and legends and epics that are out there to learn from them? And we have to have some idea how this language functions and how it interacts with our minds and with our inner self. So first are archetypical beings. Let's look at those as we start to look at all how this all functions, how we put it all together how we can soak this stuff all up. Uh, first are these archetypical beings. The lofty of these beings, and easiest to identify, of course, are God, or gods, or goddesses, avatars, saviors, prophets, gurus, uh, who are most revered in, revered in the tradition to which the dreamer belongs. Christ for the Christians. Um, Buddha for Buddhists, Krishna for Hindus, etc. <coughs> and these exalted figures also tend to be the most important in terms of the messages they convey to us. This is why, for instance, Sufis insist that Muhammad speaks to someone in a dream. His words can be relied on as much as if he'd spoken them in the flesh. And of course, if we look at that and say, well, that's Muslim, that's a that's Sufi, that's something, that's Muhammad. I don't believe in any of that junk. Well, then perhaps you need to move up above that thinking and say, okay, I get it, I understand. I'm going to move on with this. So, uh, just below these supernatural beings that we see in these archetypes are a host of lesser archetypes. Angelic spirits, venerable ancestors... <coughs> mythic animals, most of whom act as emissaries for the higher powers. And the archetypical brings that uh, beings that show up most frequently in our dreams, however, are human figures who serve as arch who serve archetypical functions. They serve as the archetype, a, a, a high priest or priestess, a pious hermit, a magnanimous monarch, a noble knight, a pure virgin, a wise old man or a woman. To give one example of how this works, you might dream that you're zooming down a highway when suddenly you see that the road ahead is blocked by an avalanche. Not knowing what to do, you get out of your car and start milling about with the rest of the travelers. And then you notice an elderly gentleman draped in a cape, beckoning you to approach. And when you go over to see what he wants, he points out a little footpath you hadn't noticed before that leads into thick primeval forest. The message of this dream 
is that you can't get to enlightenment by following the ways of the world. You have to travel alone, on foot, and be willing to enter into totally unknown territory. So as a practical matter, it might mean it's time for you to go on a vision quest or a retreat. That's one way of looking at this. And we're out of time in this first segment. We'll be right back after this break. Are you looking for a really awesome and amazing graphic designer? How about an illustrator or a photographer? This is Rainy Roberts, and I wanted to tell you how you can get my designer, illustrator husband, Scotty Roberts, to work for you on your project. Do you have an awesome self-published book but no cover, or even worse, a cover that really sucks? Do you need a kick-ass logo for your company or some f***ing awesome graphic designs for your ads or website? Then get in touch with my husband for the best f***ing awesome kick-ass design and illustration he knows his stuff and he's been at this for more years than i've been alive go to scottallenroberts.com that's scott with two t's a-l-a-n-r-o-b-e-r-t-s.com to take a look at his online portfolio of work or call 651-468-8115 now go out and kick some ass with some kick-ass graphic design hi i'm my dad so he can take me to disneyland All right, gang, thanks for waiting on through that break. This is Scotty Roberts. You're back with the Intrepid Radio Program right here on the Odyssey Radio Network. This is segment two of tonight's show. Welcome. It's Monday, and uh, you're listening on the Odyssey Radio Network, ODYSY1.com. And uh, you can also uh, watch and uh, listen over on my YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash Mr. Scotty Roberts. Come on and over and, and join the live chat room, which is going on right now. And uh, we're talking about dreams, the archetype, the the moving, well, the moving into greater perception of yourself. It's a conscious choice you make to move from your spirituality being a docile thing in your life to being a predominant thing in your life. And once you do that, everything changes on a mental level. It starts slow, and you get there. That's where you start to see, even in your dreams, the archetypes start appearing. And we just talked about a dream where you're going along a highway, uh, you get out of the car because there's an avalanche, you can't figure out how to get around, and an old man in a cape appears, or something, or a hood, or you know, he's got a raven sitting on his shoulder, whatever the archetype might look like. And he says, did you notice the little path over there? And you take the path and you end up in a rich, thick forest, um, primeval forest. Now, that's the message of the dream is that you can't get to enlightenment by following the ways of the world. That might be the way to interpret that. And that's just an example. You have to travel alone. You have to be on foot. You have to be willing to enter into a totally unknown territory. And as a practical matter, it might mean it's time for you to start separating yourself from the 
egoism, the things of the world, it's not that you give them up and then that you move on, you become a totally uh, uh, a weird person living out on a rock somewhere. No, it means that you start inwardly realizing who you are, what you are, and wanting to expand your perception. And uh, you have to travel it alone. And it's time for you to go on a vision quest or a retreat or to uh, uh, retreat in yourself to start a process of meditation, whatever that might be. Of course, not all archetypical beings appear to be so benevolent as the guy in the cape or the hat or the raven on his shoulder showing you the path around to the primeval forest. Uh, You can also dream of what the Tibetans call wrathful deities. Uh, Have you ever had anything like this happen on your spiritual path? In the West, these are things like devils and vampires and dark witches and warlords, warlocks. Uh, all these things that we perceive in our pop culture as being the evil things, but they're archetypes that show up. They all seem intent on doing us harm. Um, But no matter how malevolent they might seem in your dream, in reality, all archetypes serve to help us on our journey in some way. For instance, let's say a demon pops up in your dreams And it might represent, depending on the context, a shadow side of yourself that needs to be acknowledged and accepted, or some deep-seated fear that you must face and you have to overcome it before you can move forward on your path. It's like, uh, and I've, I've told this story once before, and I won't get into it in detail now, but the dream I had of my young son at the time, Sam, who's now 19, and he was like five or six or seven years old, when I had this dream and he was being cornered in the basement of our old ranch house by a demonic force. And uh, it was an interesting dream. It was when uh, we had the fire in our house and uh, I was home alone. Uh, My wife took the kids. uh, Well, we didn't have our kids yet. My wife was gone visiting her mom uh, so I could help clean out the smoke infested house and My older kids were still living at home, uh, my twin daughters and my son, and uh, they were off at their mom's, and I had, that's where I had that vision of, I was told I would get a visitation, and I woke up every hour throughout the night, on the strike of the hour, I would wake up, and right around four in the morning or five in the morning, I saw the two little girls standing at the foot of my bed in the uh, burlap-looking shifts with rope belts and scraggly hair and and, uh, looking like about seven or eight years old and four or five years old. And then, uh, so I got up, and then I dreamt uh, uh, of uh, my son being down in the basement and trapped and uh, by a demonic figure, and the demonic figure comes out, and it's a little girl. I'm sorry, that was my daughter's dream. Ugh. See, I mixed up the story there. Then my daughter told me she had a dream that same night. Uh, I didn't tell her about my experience, but she had a dream of uh, my her, her younger brother, my oldest son, was down in the basement and being trapped by a demonic entity. And she went and she grabbed him and yanked him upstairs out of the basement. And out of the basement, then that demonic figure had transformed into... The little a little blonde girl in a burlappy looking shift with a rope belt saying, "Well, I just wanted to play with Sam." That was my daughter's dream, and it coincided with the dream, the vision I had of the little girls. And there's more to it. I've messed it up a little bit trying to speed it through, uh, just for the sake of that. But so sometimes we see the demonic, we see the negative and the dark things that are supposed to be giving us enlightenment. And my daughter had that dream, and I had that particular vision dream maybe I don't know which it was in addition to archetypical beings though certain features of a dream's terrain can have archetypical significance especially if they're unusually awesome uh, numinous pristine a particularly majestic mountain for instance almost certainly symbolizes the sacred mountains known to all spiritual traditions like Mount Meru in Hindu and Buddhist cosmologies, 
Mount Olympus in Greek mythology, Mount Kenya in the Kikuyu of Africa. Uh, wherever this mountain is said to be located, it always represents the Axis Mundi, the center of the world, that place where heaven and earth, God and man meet. Thus Moses encountered God on Mount Horeb uh, and Mount Sinai. <clears throat> Muhammad first received the Quran in a cave on Mount Hira, possibly in a dream. And in modern times, we see Ramana Marashi uh, took up residence near the holy mountain of Aranakula. And if such a mountain appears in a mixed dream, it may indicate that what seems to be a mundane problem actually requires a spiritual solution. And now, these are just archetypes. They're archetypes and examples we're talking about. It's not like, oh, I don't ever dream about mountains. Well, it doesn't have to be a mountain. I'm using this in as, as an example. Suppose you dream you're searching through a city looking for your lost wallet or where you parked your car. In the background, looming over the rooftops, there's a huge snow-capped mountain, which seems somewhat out of place. Because wallets contain documents that indicate who we are, driver's license, social security cards, etc., etc., our credit cards, uh, they usually symbolize our personal or our egoic identity. So a city, especially a modern one, often represents the arena of worldly affairs that we have to deal with on a day-in and day-out basis. And thus the dream is saying, you'll never find your true identity following a world path. Instead, you have to become a spiritual seeker and take a path of transcendence. So you see how these archetypes work in dreams. A desert appearing in a dream can also have archetypical significance, usually representing an intermediary religion between the sacred and the profane. Thus, it's fairly common for spiritual seekers when you decide to set on a path to seek out your spirituality uh, who are undergoing a desert experience in their waking lives, a period when worldly pleasure is absent and no longer satisfied, but spiritual fruits have not yet been tasted, uh, to dream that they're wandering around lost in a physical desert. And such dreams often end with the dreamer catching sight of a lake or a stream just ahead or a, place, a piece of civilization but walking up before he or she has a chance to drink from it, waking up before you have a chance to drink from that fountain. And since water is an archetypical symbol for the regenerating power of the spirit, remember that in your dreams, that's what water does. It's a regenerating power of the spirit, as in baptism, bathing in the Ganges River or Native American sweat lodges, a dream like this may be taken as a sign of encouragement. Stay on the path is its message. And eventually you're going to find a spiritual refreshment out of that. The other night when I had the dream of the raging torrent river rolling down my street and uh, my house standing there with the open door and I'm trying to get to the house. Um, I was there, the raging stream, it wasn't even a stream, it was almost this deep, just raging down the street, the floodwaters. And uh, like a tsunami washing down my street. Uh, that water, what was that? That, that? that water was a message. And I noticed I wasn't being carried away by the water. But I was trying to work my way through the water to the open door of my home. What I identified as myself. So it's interesting how these things, because uh, water can symbolize the spirit's capacity to renew us. But it's also the power to destroy everything that stands between us and our goal. This is why it's not uncommon at a certain stage of the path for seekers to dream of a great tidal wave that threatens to sweep away everything in its way. And the sight of this wave at first produces nothing but fear in our dreams and terror. I had fear in my dream. But once it had passed, the dreamer is relieved to discover that he or she has survived without a scratch. When I entered the house... The raging torrent was gone, and I realized that nothing was even wet. Nothing got destroyed by this flood water in my dream just the other night. And so dreams like this serve to reassure us 
that in the future, even though it might feel as if everything we have is being annihilated, I know some of you, we've talked, and some of you listening tonight, you've told me about your experiences. So even if it might feel like everything we have is being annihilated, this is necessary if we're ever to complete the journey. Um, <clears throat> even in Christianity, we had... I, I, I mentioned a, a guy that I held up as a hero of the Christian faith uh, when I was a kid back in seminary and in my early youth pastoring days. Um, uh, Jim Elliott was one of the five missionaries who in uh, the middle 50, 1950s was killed by the Alka Indians. And, and uh, um, his wife went back in and ministered to these, to these people after the, the killings. Uh, they were uh, five of them were found dead floating down the river, and uh, um, but this guy had journals, and I read his journals, and he became kind of a hero of the faith for me at the time, and uh, I remember that he said, uh, "God will never use a person greatly until he has wounded them deeply." And that meant a lot to me back then, and it still does. And maybe you'll look at that and go, Christianity, oh, I don't know if I buy it, because we have this anti-Christian thing going on these days, and there certainly are reasons to question things. But when you're in the faith, take that out of the faith and say, our higher power, our God, our whoever it is we look to, the universe itself, source, originator, may never use us greatly until he allows us to be wounded deeply. And if you're going through those experiences where you feel things are being taken away, you're gaining no ground, you're losing ground, uh, that could be what you're being put through to purify you, to bring you to the spot you need to be, the realization that things have to be stripped away. Uh, the raging torrents of water around you, washing away the egoism, washing away the stuff that goes on around you in life. Um, so you can emerge better. Uh, there was an old song in the Christian faith um, uh, that talked about uh, the refiner's fire is what I desire. Um, to be purged uh, and and purified, um, and when this process has taken place, I shall come forth as gold. Uh, so whether egoist, e egoic, or or archetypical, most dreams we have tell us a story. Usually, the plot revolves around the dreamer attempting to achieve some objective, to arise at some destination, to prepare for a test, to communicate with a friend, to care for a child, to escape an assassination, etc., 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 etc. We all have these dreams. Archetypical dreams have archetypical plots, which are variation of the plots of the world's great myths and legends. One of the most universal plots is the quest for some kind of supernatural treasure. The golden fleece, the holy grail, the philosopher's stone, the elixir of eternal life, uh, the magic sword, uh, all of which in the mystic's view represent realization, gnosis, enlightenment. But as in any good story, first there are obstacles to overcome, oceans we have to cross, mountains we have to climb, dragons to slay, enemies to fight, things that hinder us along the way. And these, of course, represent those spiritual obstacles in our life. All our self-centered desires and aversions, attachments, fears, which must be abandoned and surrendered. In most mixed dreams this type, of this type, the object of the quest is represented by an archetypical symbol while the obstacles are represented by personal symbols. You might find, for instance, uh, a dream that you're walking up a mountain path in search of some precious jewel, uh, pearl beyond price, uh, wish-fulfilling gems, things like that. 
when suddenly you come on a lumberjack with tears streaming down his face who bars your way. If, as in the previous example, you had an abusive father named Jack, remember that from the other day? This dream could well mean that before you can make further progress, you need to forgive your father. You might need to, uh, or, or, or completely let go of any resentment you're still harboring toward him. And that's just one example. There are obstacles that we face in these dreams that if we're thinking through them and working to understand them, the obstacles to finding the great thing that we're on a quest for are usually the things that we have to deal with. Be it a father that was abusive. Be it a mother who was abusive as well. Be it anybody in our paths that have, in a sense, prohibited our forward momentum in life. Uh, these are represented by the obstacles in our dreams. So finally, it's, it's, it's possible, especially during the more advanced stages of the path, to have dreams whose archetypical contents are so clear that they need little or no explanation at all. Of course, uh, uh, that you're familiar with the traditional symbols and metaphors in which they've closed themselves. You have to be familiar with that a bit. That's why I said it's good to get in touch with epics and legends and mythology and so on. The great Sufi Rabia, for example, had a dream in which she met a young girl who took her to a palace full of serving girls carrying trays of light. And the serving girls told her that the light trays were funeral spice intended for someone who was drowned in the seas and become a martyr. The young girl told the serving girls to rub Rabia's with spices and then gave Rabia this advice. Your prayers are your light. Your devotion is your strength. Sleep is the enemy of both. Your life is the only opportunity that life can give you. If you ignore it, if you waste it, you will only turn to dust. What an incredible message when you think about that. Think about that even apart from dreams. Your life is the only opportunity that life gives you. And if you ignore your life, if you waste it, you're only going to turn into dust. Now, all that's needed to understand the meaning of that dream is to know that the phrase, drown in the seas and became a martyr is a common Sufi way of alluding to that spiritual death, which is a prerequisite for attaining union with the ocean of divine consciousness. Similarly, anyone familiar with the archetypical figures found in the Christian tradition will recognize how this dream now I'm going to tell you about, which the Franciscan monk, monk Brother Leo had, illustrates the power of con unconditional love to vanquish sin and guilt says Leo saw two ladders leading up to heaven. One was as red as blood, and the other was as white as lilies. At the top of the red ladder there appeared Christ, his face full of wrath. St. Francis beckoned to his brothers to not fear and to climb the ladder. They try, but they fail. Francis prays, but Christ displays his wounds and thunders. Your brothers have done this to me. So St. Francis runs down and leads his brethren to the white ladder, which they scale effortlessly and without mishap to find Mary at the top, all smiles to welcome them. Now that is steeped, of course, in Christian mythology, Christian tradition. But the most transparent of spiritual dreams, however, are those in which the seeker receives direct instructions or teachings that need no interpretation whatsoever. The red ladder or the white ladder. If an archetype appears at all, it's not to add anything to the teaching, but only to underscore its importance. And Somebody I knew dreamt once that he was sitting on a cloud listening to a Tibetan Lama giving a talk on spiritual practice. 
to a group of disciples. And after a while, my friend spoke up in his dream and says, Oh, I get it. The highest practice is to do nothing. To which the Lama replied, Even that is too much. So now, needless to say, that teaching pertains only to the last stages of the path. In the meantime, there's much to do. Uh, not the least of which is pay attention to your dreams and the guidance you receive from them. And so, for all of us, dreaming these dreams, having these archetypical dreams that go on, uh, we have to pay attention to what they are. Now, <clears throat> I've talked a little high and mighty about this whole archetypical dream process, but there's really no difference between the waking state of that dream except that one seems more stable than the other. Waking state versus dream. And only after there's an awakening in the form of some kind of enlightenment is it realized that the waking world itself indeed is nothing but a long dream resulting from mental disposition, a movement in consciousness in which what seems to be a solid body and its sufferings are really an illusion. And so dreams are tools of transformation. Uh, at certain levels of inner work, dreams stop being dreams and instead become spiritual levels of consciousness. But in the meantime, dreams open invisible doors to subtler levels of our spiritual growth awakening in seekers of truth and wisdom, our permanent witness, so to speak, or our soul within our conscious self. This is why we need to pay attention to what we dream, while at the same time we pay attention to what kind of spiritual path we're pursuing. Are we just living? How many times have we talked about it? Are we just living life? And sometimes, ain't nothing wrong with just living life. Yesterday, my wife, Rainy, and I over at Rocky and Lisa's, we were just living life and uh, loving and living and enjoying it. Uh, but if that's what you do and you move back into your, your everyday experiences, um, they can pull you down sometimes. Because if you are not placing a higher spiritual significance on them, if you are not looking for the spiritual purpose, and the path that you need to be on, and the path that you need to take. And so there are all kinds of things that happen in our dreams. And tomorrow, 23 hours from now, we're going to pick this up again, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this. Um, again, because we, we haven't touched the surface of the whole idea of mystical dreaming, and what goes on, the archetypes the different levels of dreaming. I'm just looking at my notes here. Spiritual alchemy. All of these things, the, 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 the symbols of spiritual alchemy in our dreams. So we're going to talk about that tomorrow when we come back. So I want to thank you for being here. I hope that this stuff is latching, that you're able to latch onto this, that you get exactly what I'm saying, where we're going with this. There's a physical life that we all live and there's a spiritual path that some of us choose. So where are you on your spiritual path? And many times, not many times, it will always manifest itself in your dreams. You will get those contact dreams. And I think if you're not seeking a spiritual path, you can still get a contact dream if it's from the other side. But then there are the spiritual archetypes, our gods, our angels, our devils. Um, all these things will start to manifest in our dreams and deliver messages to us that help us along our spiritual path. I kind of crave those dreams because it tells me I'm pursuing the right things. So there you go, folks. That's all we got for tonight. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Catch you tomorrow night. Have a good rest of your night.